Good morning, all. We'll wait for another minute uh, until 8 a.m. and then uh, RG will start with the introduction. Thanks for joining. I guess we'll wait till five after, like seven five, if that's okay. Yeah, looks okay. Yeah, we just noticed that the chat is disabled. I'm not sure why. Uh, it's allowing us to chat with hosts and panelists, but not with everyone, which is not typical. Um, I think we can use the Q and A um, part. I was, able, instead. I, was uh -huh. able to, I was able to write to everyone, so I'm hoping. Oh, I'm hoping. So it works. Uh, I don't know. Does anyone want to try? Uh... It works. Yeah. 
Uh, now I can, but I had to click through to every, uh, everyone on your, mm -hmm. you know, blog. Okay. Thanks. No, it's not, it's not letting me. All right, uh, let's begin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this truly is uh, a medical physics for world uh, benefit webinar because we actually have three amazing speakers from uh, three different parts of uh, our world. Uh, part. Um, we have Dr. Vanessa Panettieri from Australia, uh, Dr. Shurva Kumar from India, and Dr. Sion Kim from uh, US. Um, and today's topic that will be or th uh, they'll be presenting on is uh, SGRT and motion management. Uh, this webinar has been supported by Vision RT, so a huge thanks to them. Uh, the moderators for the session uh, is uh, Sarah uh, Ashmig and myself, uh, Arjit. So thank you so much for joining in. Uh, just a few slides uh, before we actually start the webinar. So as mentioned, uh, it's been uh, today's webinar has been supported by Vision RT, um, and each speaker will have about twenty minutes, uh, just in the interest of time. And then after everyone talks, we'll have an open Q and A session, and uh, with some final comments. And uh, don't worry, the whole webinar will be recorded, and uh, it will be on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, for of MP, uh, MPWB, so you can go back and uh, listen to actually all our webinars uh, that have uh, taken place in the last uh, two years. A little bit about our speakers. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Panettieri is uh, an accredited senior medical physicist currently working at the famous Peter McCallum Cancer Center with uh, 20 years of experience in radiation oncology. She is an adjunct associate professor at Monash University and Sir Peter McCallum Department of Oncology, the University of Melbourne uh, in Australia. Prior to moving to Australia in 2010, uh, Vanessa has worked as research medical physicist at the famous Karolinska Hospital in Sweden and Clatterbridge Cancer Center in UK, focusing on treatment planning calculations in the context of SBRT and biologically based clinical trials. Vanessa has contributed to more than 40 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and her current research interests are in predictive modeling, automated planning, and advanced imaging for treatment individualization, with strong focus on uh, today's topic being surface-guided radiation therapy. Our next speaker is Dr. Sharva uh, Kumar. He's an associate professor at the PSG Institute of Medical Science and Research in Coimbatore. He has 11 years of clinical experience and 13 years uh, in research. And uh, he just implemented the SGRT system in a busy uh, radiotherapy department. Last, we have Dr. Seon Kim. Uh, he's been in the field of medical physics for more than 25 years, including four years of PhD study and two years of uh, radiation oncology clinical physics residency training, both at the University of Florida. He has been working in the Department of uh, Radiation Oncology at Mayo Clinic, Florida, and his major specialities were HDR brachytherapy, respiratory management, and image-guided stereotactic uh, body radiation therapy. Currently, he's a professor and serves as the Director of Clinical Physics in the Department of uh, Radiation Oncology at Virginia Commonwealth University. He has served uh, as, as editorial board for four different journals and reviewer for 35 different scientific journals. His publication includes 80 and 180 peer reviewed articles and abstracts respectively. He has also published one WPM report, 14 book chapters and one edited book. So welcome to uh, all three of you. Um, as mentioned, uh, we will be talking about uh, surface guided imaging and 
Uh, this uh, webinar has been supported by Vision RT. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this. Uh, just give our speakers uh, the opportunity to talk about their experience. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier, please type in your questions, uh, I guess, in the Q&A section uh, that you have, and we will address them uh, one by one after uh, all the speakers are done uh, giving the talks. So without further ado, uh, I will stop sharing. And then, Dr. Kumar, you can uh, share your screen. Yeah, thank you so much for your brief introduction, uh, uh, Ajay. So I'm just sharing my screen and... Uh, okay. Okay. So... So you can see my screen, everyone? Yes, we can. Yeah. So uh, good morning to everyone. So I'm uh, Dr. Sarano Kumar, working as Associate Professor of Medical Physics in PhD Institute of Medical Sciences and Research in southern part of India, Tamil Nadu, Coimbatore. So I'm just giving uh, our experience on SGRT in our uh, Indian clinical aspects. And our institution is situated in southern part of India, Tamil Nadu, in Coimbatore. So we have uh, uh, coming under Sons and Charities Trust. We have started in 1926. And uh, 1985, the PhD Institute of Medical Science and Research was uh, established. And 1987, the PhD hospital was established. With uh, Now we are equipped with 200 beds hospital, super speciality hospital in southern part of India, Tamil Nadu. So we are a quaternary care and super speciality transplant unit and oncology service we have recently started. So we, act we also have a teaching program postgraduate and uh, uh, bachelor's degree. And we have also allied health sciences in every year we are taking a minimum on 200 seats. And uh, this is our institute. We were recently uh, established this Institute of Oncology. In our radiotherapy department, we are equipped with various true beam uh, hyper arc machine and uh, attached with uh, CRAD surface guided radiation therapy. And we have a dedicated uh, CT simulator and we have a dedicated brachytherapy unit from ELECTA. So now we are the, under the process of uh, uh, um, uh, installing of uh, Radizac, uh, Acura Radizac X9 uh, tomotherapy machine for our uh, center as a second machine. And the SGIT is like surface guided radiation therapy. We all know about that uh, surface guided using. Uh, 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 our surface uh, monitoring to uh, during the treatment for uh, patient treatment in radiotherapy department. So the actually the system using surface of the patient for the localization and it is an alternative method for tattoo free technology for the uh, radiotherapy patient who require for the cancer treatment. And the system uses three uh, 3D camera technology uh, to track the and monitor the patient movement during the setup and treatment and interfraction and intrafraction motion management. So the system, how does the system it work? So actually the system will have a one uh, camera system to project the light on the patient and one uh, uh, camera system which capturing the uh, light interact on the patient and then reflected light captured from the camera system which is installed in the uh, gantry room. So here the patient ISO center will be captured in a three-dimensional area where the three camera system are uh, concentrating on the patient uh, uh, surface. So the system will work, works again the projecting visible light and patient skin and reflected light used to generate the real-time motion map of the surface option. So actually what we uh, using that surface guide act, it is very important thing like you don't know what you can't see on the patient during the treatment and what you see, you can't see. That is the uh, technology which we are using uh, surface guided radiation therapy because it the mon system monitoring the patient uh, during the treatment from the setup, so patient setup and uh, during the treatment and after the treatment. That is the advantage we are having using surface guided radiation therapy. So the lot of studies uh, are already established, uh, like the surface guided is the um, um, already adopted technology for all other countries, like uh, uh, like UK, Europe, and European, US uh, uh, countries. In India, since we are not having that much uh, awareness on surface guided radiation therapy, because since we are not having any clinical papers on this. So recently we have adopted the surface guided technology in few hospitals in India. I think uh, last year we adopted this technology as a first of kind uh, kind of technology in uh, Indian uh, uh, scenario, because we are the first hospital in India having adopted that CRED surface guided radiation therapy from Catalyst plus HD model. It's the first 
uh, uh, setup you uh, established in uh, PSG hospital. So there are a lot of studies have been conducted so far in uh, other parts of the country. And in India, we are starting uh, the clinical implementation and the establishment of surface radiation therapy for the radiation treatment. Uh, the principle of HGRT is actually, it is uh, uh, like uh, the, before we start uh, treat the patient using surface guided radiation therapy, we can position the patient on the treatment room and then we can see the reference image of the based on body contour and then the live image will be created by the camera system. So both it will be matched before we start the treatment. So this tolerance will be uh, uh, like uh, we can uh, uh, set the tolerance based on the institutional practice. It starts from maybe 5 mm and the day by day you can reduce to 3 mm or 2 mm and sub millimeter accuracy also. So far we have been using for surface guided radiation therapy for the positioning uh, purpose. So this is the uh, validation like um, uh, uh, data we have uh, based on surface guided and CBCT uh, positioning uh, by using uh, uh, surface guided seroid surface guided radiation therapy and the uh, LINAC uh, CBCT algorithm. So lateral and longi and vertical we have compared almost uh, the all within the uh, the both the SGRT and CBCT values are match uh, uh, with the uh, uh, each other. So we have executed the treatment based on the CBCT, but also we are now evaluating the surface guided. Uh, uh, technology, how it will be useful for the uh, treatment of patient during uh, patient positioning and uh, treatment. And maybe in future, we may avoid that uh, imaging dose for the, uh, what we can say, so you, the matching of the internal organs. That application for uh, radiation therapy in surface guided, we can use it for patient positioning and patient monitoring system during the treatment. And it's a gated delivery for DABH patient, for left breast patient, we can use this uh, technology uh, uh, for the surface uh, guided. And uh, in our hospital, we have a uh, 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 dedicated CT simulator where we have installed a 4D C Sentinel 4D CT system. This system will be exactly useful for uh, uh, monitoring the patient for the DABH cases where we uh, treat the left breast. And also it will be laser-based optical surface scanning system with the functionality of 4D, reconstruct 4D CT reconstruction and gated imaging. It is also provide the reference image for the patient positioning and intrafractional motion detection in the gantry uh, treatment room. And also we have a one uh, uh, system called a couch tracking system. It will be useful uh, for the, uh, during the baggage treatment, that couch movement uh, vertically, how it will be moved. So it will be monitor, keep on monitoring during the whole uh, simulation process. And in a LINAC room, there are three camera systems that's called Catalyst plus HD system. So during the treatment, it will be monitoring the patient. It will give the 3D, uh, three dimensional view of the patient. It will be helpful for uh, a technologist and the treatment team to monitor the patient. Uh, during the treatment for position, sorry, motion management and any other uh, uh, problems will be faced for, during the uh, uh, setup time. And also it is a HD system for high precision uh, positioning and intrafraction motion management. It is also useful for the respiratory gating for the conventional stereotactic radiotherapy, uh, radiotherapy, uh, radio uh, treatment delivery. In, in what the concept for the motion management so actually it is not about the just push back uh, pushing back and forward for uh, uh, to the point of interest because it's always uh, doing the treatment how the tumor will be get impacted so this is not in, in our hand so we have to be very careful so during the treatment the patient should not move and the target should not be missed for the treatment so for that reason we can use a lot of technology starting from uh, uh, like uh, a conventional method using uh, thermoplastic molds in simulation we, uh, in mold room we were prepared. Then after that, we'll replicate the, the same setup in the CT simulation. And then finally, we are replicating in the treatment room. For that, what we are doing, that is the most advanced technology now we are adapted in our hospital. That's called surface guided. So here uh, we can uh, uh, see, first we we'll use this uh, masking system. And then after that, we have started with uh, uh, three point method where the laser uh, uh, can be used for uh, positioning the patient in the treatment room. And then after that, the other technology is coming like uh, surface gated. And in some that is a, a uh, uh, system, they have a synchrony for uh, live tumor tracking. These are the various options, but what exactly will be useful for the patient while treating the patient in the treatment room? That is more uh, uh, like uh, uh, challenging one. So before we use the technology, the technologist should communicate with the patient what is exactly we are going to use for the patient. That is more important because if you are not properly convey the message to the patient, the patient will get disturbed and their mindset is not always that much uh, 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 like confident that before they have diagnosed the cancer, right? So for that, we need to 
communicate the patient and what we are going to do for the patient and what they have to do on the treatment room and simulation room and then uh, 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 like a mold room, all those things. So everybody is a king when everything is inside the room. That is a more uh, important thing because if the line is inside and the, the person is standing outside the uh, window, is, they are very safe. But your organ at risk also, it will be safe while right? you are protecting your normal cells from the radiation. Okay, so for that reason, we are using different kind of technology to ensure the treatment delivery. So motion management is basically uh, divided into three types, like intrafracture motion management, which includes heartbeat, swallowing, coughing, and eye movement during the treatment. And intra interfraction motion management is between the fractions, like maybe a tumor size can change and position can change or weight gain or loss. Due to that, the tumor position also can change. And position deviation. So day one, the technologists will be very keen mind to set the patient on proper uh, uh, making like uh, the body contour or three-point method or uh, using backlogs or using mask, thermoplastic mask like that and everything. And then during the treatment, we cannot control anything. So the patient can cough on during the treatment. How could be uh, the pay, uh, technology monitoring the patient? Or sometimes uh, the, uh, during the treatment, patient can swallow in. Sometimes they're, they're, they're swallowing. Due to that, the motion will be uh, initiated in the patient, uh, uh, that thing. So for that, we need to have a daily checklist before we started the treatment. And the same exact patient will be placed on the couch and every fractions. That should be uh, ensured from the technology side. And then you technologist can relax and execute the treatment. There is a video uh, image it will uh, replicate here. So for that, we are using, uh, in PSG, we are using surface guided for uh, setup and positioning, but still we are executing the treatment based on only CBCT, not directly from the uh, surface guided because our institution, our department was started only eight months before. Uh, so far, we have treated uh, 300 patients and out of 300, we have treated almost 80 patients from using uh, using surface guided addition therapy in out of which we have uh, treated almost uh, 10 DA big age patient by using this uh, technology. So this uh, system will use the 3D surface positioning during the treatment and the uh, uh, course of treatment. And the patent color map projected on the patient body uh, for, to match the patient on the couch. That is more uh, important thing in, uh, thing in this uh, technology. And also it's a correct any poster or positioning errors immediately, which is connected with the 4D, uh, sorry, city couch. So we have a licensing uh, uh, from CRAD and uh, Varian Mission. It will connect it with the uh, 6D couch. So whenever if you uh, found uh, the shift is more than uh, with our more than our tolerance, that automatically the shift will be applied. This will be captured by the uh, a 60 couch and the couch uh, error will be uh, applied, a shift will be applied uh, before the treatment. And even though we are following only CBCT based treatment, we are not yet followed based on SGRT because still we are evaluating the system on Indian patients. And DABH, we have uh, treated more than uh, 10 patients by using uh, uh, this uh, serial surface data. And we found like uh, the free breath and deep breath automatically the lung and heart dose will be uh, ultimately reduced by using a deep breath technology by using the surface guided of uh, uh, CRAD. And this is uh, some example. Uh, and also we can avoid that uh, lung and heart dose if you are uh, uh, properly coach the patient. The coaching for the patient is very, very important uh, here because if you're not properly coaching the patient, the patient cannot be uh, take uh, uh, proper, they, they should, the patient cannot properly follow that uh, uh, breathing uh, cycle. So if you're, if the patient is not following breathing cycle, then definitely it will not going to work for any kind of patients. That is more important. And so the auto beam hole technology also be uh, actually using that uh, uh, auto beam uh, hole technology for normal patient also because uh, some, I think we, we uh, treated one uh, head and neck patient. In that patient, during the treatment, the patient's cough. So during the cough, the beam will be get pulled if the patient moves out of tolerance. There's additional uh, technology we are, uh, uh, actually we were faced in this uh, system. So this will give a uh, setup and system will continue to monitor the patient posture and portion, uh, position during the treatment. And it is also uh, gives the information about the real-time intrafraction motion monitoring of the patient and uh, real-time patient movements over the threshold immediately the beam will get pulled. That is an additional uh, advantage of having your uh, surface gated. And it is continuously calculating of the isocentric shift and enabling the detection of slower relaxation or sliding movements of the patient during the, inter, uh, during the treatment of uh, a patient. And also, so DABH, uh, we have a visual coaching panel. So the three uh, important things uh, we have to understand before we 
treat the uh, left breast patient with the uh, de uh, deep uh, inspiration breath hold technique. So for that, we actually using uh, goggles, which will give the idea about patient, how they are breathing uh, during the treatment. So that it will give, uh, the goggle will have uh, information about their breathing cycle, breathing pattern. This window, it will show the patient about their breathing uh, pattern inside. If the patient is properly, uh, sorry, normal breathing, the room light will be uh, uh, like uh, blue color. And if the patient is take a deep breath, the green line, sorry, this line will go inside the green uh, uh, window. If the line is inside the green window, means room light, uh, room color will be changing into the green. So the patient can uh, uh, think like, okay, uh, uh, our breathing is uh, normal range. So the patient uh, treatment will execute that. In case the patient is get extra breath, so deep breath means it's taking too much breath. So this should be identified before we starting the treatment. So, so patient should be given uh, a proper education or coaching before we start the treatment, minimum five days. Then only the patient will give, uh, uh, patient will cooperate with our treatment. Otherwise, patient will get confused. So uh, that more important before we treat the treat before we treat the patient, we should give proper coaching to the patient, minimum five days. Then only we will get uh, achieve our goal. So other than uh, DA package, we can also use uh, a few extremities uh, treatment by using surface guided radiation therapy. These are a few examples. This is uh, uh, actually we are getting. I'm getting this information from one of my colleague in uh, University of Washington, Seattle, where they treated uh, some kind of uh, uh, treatments using surface guided. And uh, the ABM uh, have already established some pro uh, like uh, clear protocol for HGRT process map. This is very important because we are uh, any new technology if we are following, we have to follow some uh, in national, international protocols. So APM uh, TG protocol is clear information about the how the surface guided should be used for the uh, patient treatment. In our hospital, we have established uh, our own institution protocol. So this is our protocol because first we have uh, export the image with the body contour and then the patient will be set up at position by using the body contour and also using the laser point in the uh, gantry room. Then the SGRT takes a body counter as a reference image in the gantry room. Then after that, we have to take the CBCT. Then if it is required, we should apply the shift and then we will capture the live image. That's the new protocol which we are uh, established recently in our hospital. And then reference image is captured in the CRAD monitor. Then we have to execute the treatment. So during the treatment is the patient will move. The system will identify you the patient position uh, motion uh, during the treatment. Then after you have to complete the treatment. The second day, we have to use that first day reference, first day image as a reference image. Then we have to uh, note down the shift from the SGRT and then take the CBCT. We have taken CBCT for second day also because we are evaluating the system. Then if, if the value is not by higher than our previous day, we can directly go to the uh, treatment option. So then we, can, we don't want to apply any shift. Then uh, it will update the reference image in the SGRT monitor. If the reference value beyond that uh, tolerance of day one uh, image. Then we have to execute the treatment. And we can monitor the patient motion during the treatment. We can complete the second treatment. And third day, again, we have to use the previous day image as a reference image in setting patient positioning for the third day image. Then we have to follow the uh, uh, consequent uh, method for treating the patient. So far in PSG, we have treated uh, 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 almost uh, 74 patients out of which we have treated 10 patients in uh, DAB uh, In Out of 70, 64, thorax we have treated 59, abdomen we have treated 4, and at night without mask we have treated 1 patient. And for all the patients we have monitored and uh, verified with uh, lateral lunge and vertical uh, shift compared to SGRT with CBCT, which is all within the limit 1.2, 1.4, 1.4 vertical for lateral lunge and vertical. Rotation is almost 0.7 degree for each, uh, for all uh, uh, three uh, positions. So using SRS and SRT for uh, SGRT. So since our equipment have an option of uh, treating hyper, uh, option of treating SRS and SRT, but that also the SGRT can be useful for using open face mask. So that's this very simple example we have uh, given. And we have treated one SRT, two SRT patients so far, but we are not used for HGRT on this. And uh, HGRT, for SRS treatment for HGRT, using, so a lot of references are available you from Lund University and USCO guidelines and APM guidelines and all other guidelines. So it is very clear mentioned that it is possible to forgo the mask all together for frameless SRS guided by using surface imaging technology. 
this is a more important thing because so a lot of studies are shown uh, shown like uh, SGRT is very useful for treating SRS cases by using open face mask. Without face mask, we cannot do, but using open face mask, we can uh, execute the treatment. And couch accuracy for SRS with SGRT. So you can see there is a uh, uh, so lot, uh, the difference like a mean uh, standard deviation value for uh, couch uh, translation rotation by using SRS cases. It will give the value like a maximum 0.1 uh, uh, mm with all together and longi is 0.4 and uh, later will be the uh, point i think uh, 162 uh, millimeter so we can constantly use that sgrt system for treating srs patient by using open face mask this additional uh, uh, information and so the Recommendation for SRS and S, uh, SRT treatment by using SGRT. We should always use the continuous monitoring system of the patient by employing SGRT based on the post CBCT reference surface image. And the tolerance should be usually institution level, but as per TG protocol, it will give the less than one mm a millimeter for translation and less than one degree for the rotation should be determined based on the institutional practice. And whenever the tolerance are exceeded, immediately. Yeah, immediately the qualified medical physicist should determine the whether this is the because of patient mo motion or camera occlusion or extreme couch rotation. They should be identified by the qualified medical physicist and then the treatment will be executed based on the CBCT, not only uh, blindly based on our uh, SGRT, any SGRT systems. And the recommendation for SRS and SGRT, we should always use the DICOM surface image from CT simulation for initial setup. And uses the camera acute surface taken at the treatment machine after the verification with the internal margin by, by exam for CBCT machines. And the region of interest should be always tracking include forehead, nose, temporal bones, but exclude the movable of anatomy such as the chin and eyes because it's always chin and eyes will give the, uh, uh, the more uh, uh, error in the, uh, in the system. So the minimum tolerance should be one mm may be used for uh, uh, PTV margin and for the planning and inclusion of couch walkout efforts. And also care should be taken when using SGRT for mono centric treatment for multiple reasons and tolerance may be needed for decrease the ensure the compar uh, comparable target covering. It's also the uh, uh, ideal recommendation from the TG protocol for treating SRS and SRT by using SGRT system. Same like it's a, just protocol. Sorry, I'm taking too much time. And uh, there's a time difference between SGRT and non-SGRT patient in our hospital. So we always uh, reduce uh, considerable time for the treatment and patient simulation and uh, uh, treatment room and uh, uh, gantry room. So this is based on our hospital, less than 30 minutes for CT simulation and SGRT reduced less than 15 minutes. And treatment room, we can take only 15 minutes for positioning and treatment execution. And without SG so with SGRT, we can take only eight minutes. Daily QA as per TG protocol, we can do uh, uh, Lena QA and CT QA uh, uh, for the machines. And then clinical sites, we can treat any kind of cancer uh, treatment by based on TG302. And uh, this is the implementation process of our uh, SGRT system. I can skip this. And uh, the key features, I think you know all our about SGRT is high resolution surface imaging for sub millimeter accuracy. It is excellent image quality with higher dynamic uh, range and real time motion management with high speeds camera and uh, rub shoot handling of patient chain swelling or weight loss and accurate isocentral alignment with the 60, uh, 60 couch corrections and breath hold and free breath also possible by using SGRT. And uh, so monitor the patient during entire fraction, beam delivery, verification imaging, and uh, reduce the uh, need of verification imaging so that we can reduce the imaging dose to the patient on daily basis. And vendors in the market, Vision RT, CRAD and Identify, we have chosen uh, CRAD. So this is based on institutional policy, you can uh, uh, choose your uh, system. And uh, I just want to acknowledge my team uh, from PSG radiotherapy team and the Lund University Hospital team and uh, Seattle uh, uh, from Johan Mayer, who's giving me a lot of information over the CRT for implementing in our hospital. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I've uh, done my job. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. Uh, if you can stop sharing your screen. Uh, in the yeah. interest of times, uh, and also Dr. Kumar has to catch a flight, uh, 
there are some questions we will send it to you and then you can uh reply to those questions uh at your convenience and we'll uh share the, your answers with uh all the attendees yeah sure uh i think let's see uh can you end yeah. your oh. should be on the top you should be able to i think oh wait uh, i can do it i, you, I think there, you can there, yeah there awesome so thank you so much for uh, uh, opportunity that i just want to leave uh, we can catch up in uh, uh, later on we'll do that thank you so much thank you thank you thank you all right uh our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Vanessa Panettieri. Uh, so without further ado, please uh, take over. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, it's very nice to be with you all today. And good morning, good afternoon. And for the people like me that are in the middle of the night, good evening. Um, so it's uh, my pleasure today to talk to you about the use of SGRT in radiotherapy and in particular to bring you our experience from Australia, where we've been using this system since 2009. So I am currently, sorry, my pointer. I am currently employed at Peter McCallum Cancer Center and these are my disclosures. And also I wanted you to know that since last year, I worked at Alfred Health Radiation Oncology, which was the pioneer in the installation of SGRT in Australasia with the first system installed in 2009. So just to give you an idea where we are in the world. So obviously we are in Australia and Peter McCallum Cancer Center has five campuses, which are in the state of Victoria, which is a state south. Let's say in Australia, we have four campuses in the metropolitan region and then one in a regional area. So we have about 16 linear accelerator and 10 of these accelerator are equipped with SGRT systems. And the first system has gone live in August, 2021. And since then we have treated a large number of patients using SGRT as a setup tool and also as a monitoring tool. And I hope I can give you a sort of an example of what we do in our clinical practice. So what is surface guided radiation therapy? I mean, the previous speaker has given you already a wonderful you know, description of this technology but it is an emerging non-radiographic technology. And I think the word non-radiographic is really important here, which allows you on the LINAC to assume the role of the clinician eyes in order to enable a more robust setup. And these systems are going are replacing very fast, I think, the three-point technique that we are using and that we have been using traditionally with our patients. It also allows um, intrafraction motion monitoring during the treatment, and as you have seen before, beam holding. Additionally, there are systems that are equipped on the CT scanners, and this allows contactless motion monitoring for 4D and breath hold acquisitions. And there are more emerging sort of um, uh, applications of the SGRT system that are coming to light. And also there are more systems that have been developed by new vendors. But as you've heard before, the three main commercial systems that we have available are the CRAD Catalyst system. You have here a sort of a picture, but you've already heard quite a lot about this system. There is the Variant Identify system that again has three cameras which are mounted on the ceiling of your bunker. And then finally, we have the Vision RT Align RT system, which is a system I've been working with in the past, let's say 10 years, and with the, which I have the most of my experience. So a lot of the examples that you're gonna see today are from this system. However, the principles you're gonna hear are similar to the previous system and also to others that are available in uh, commercially. So the Vision RT system has three ceiling mounted cameras. Um, here you have some of the models of the cameras that have been provided by Vision RT. These cameras project a visible red light, so it's red for Align RT. This is structural light with a pseudo-random speckle pattern, which is projected from each of these cameras onto the patient. So the 2D information, which is sort of collected by each camera, is then converted into 3D coordinates via triangulation and visualized as a surface rendering. And this is done by the software, which is available with the cameras. So this is the console of the Vision RT system and this real-time surface that you can see here. 
is aligned either with the planning city surface. And when we talk about planning city surface, this is sent from the treatment planning system. And we have to make sure that this doesn't contain any supporting devices because we are monitoring the patient. And, uh, uh, or for example, a reference surface, which we can acquire during the treatment. So this alignment is done by looking into a region of interest. This region of interest is user defined. There are some uh, you know, uh, guidelines to how a region of interest should be sort of uh, drawn onto the patient, but it's usually user defined according to the area that we're gonna be monitoring and treating, but also according to areas that we wanna position carefully on the treatment machines. So the alignment between the real time sort of surface which is acquired on the treatment and the surface that is sent either from the CT scanner or the reference surface is then sort of calculated into displacements. And these displacements are in six degrees of freedom, as you can see here. The interesting part I think that I would like to sort of point out is that these six degrees of freedom are calculated independently on the couch that you have available. So even if you have a four DOF couch, you can still look at the AlignRT system, for example, or the SGRT system in general, and then correct your patient for roll and pitch before you performing your imaging. And the displacements are, um, can be other static. So you can take a capture and just look at that specific moment. But most of the time, the users, and you've heard it before, use this system with an update in real time of these displacements. The displacements can then be surrounded by desired thresholds, which are, again, user-defined according to the area that you want to be treating. And that allows to beam hold and uh, the, 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 the beam in case the thresholds are exceeded. I mean, the beam hold is an option. You can also not have it available, but the majority of the users will use it because it's actually a very nice feature. I thought I will bring up another feature that is available with the VisionRT system, which is the video function. The video function is an extremely useful tool. Uh, it's also called postural alignment because it provides you with the contours of the patient. And so it gives you an aid when you're trying to position areas such as, for example, the chin or the arms, which are not directly in the treatment fields sometimes, but still they need to be outside the area and they need to be positioned correctly. So this is an extremely useful aid. I will also mention that it's extremely useful when you're positioning patients with the open face masks. It also allows you to take the SSD. So a typical workflow with this system is that you position the patient on the couch and then using the DICOM surface, you either adjust the rotations or you adjust the translations. You can do this manually or you can do this automatically and you can do this in which direction you wanna do it according to your workflow. However, this is a very swift process. And as you have seen from the times that you've seen from a previous speaker can make set up very quickly. One of the things that the RTs always sort of talk about is the fact that with this system, we have less manual handling. However, there are many more advantages and I thought I will bring you some examples by looking at the treatment areas that we can sort of aid the positioning with, with these type of systems. The first one that I think it's important to note and talk about is obviously the treatment of breast cancer and, and, and the advantages that these type of systems have, have brought into these type of treatments. And then these advantages have extended to other areas of the thorax and pelvis and abdomen. So we've heard it before, traditionally, we have been positioning our patients by using external surrogates. These external surrogates are obviously a, um, an aid that is used in combination with the in-room lasers in order to position a patient according to 3D coordinate. And again, they are a surrogate for the isocenter. So these external marks are either placed on the patient immobilization device, like you see here, or they're, patient, they're placed on the patient's skin. And I wanna sort of focus on the marks that are placed on the patient's skin. These have obviously quite a lot of issues. 
Some of them are related with the psychosocial implication for the patients. There is a lot of literature out there that says that for patients having a memory of a mark, for example, if it's permanent, like a tattoo, but even if it's temporary, just for the duration of the treatment, can be a burden and psychologically a memory of their treatment. And, and also there are some other implications, for example, of the use of marks such as tattoos. Tattoos can expand, like you can see here, and so become less accurate in positioning. So what is happening nowadays is that centers that have, you know, the luck of having an SGRT installed, they can actually move towards sort of removing, completing these marks by aiding the setup using the SGRT systems. There are quite a lot of publications out there that talk about sort of these applications. This is just a very quick search that I did on PubMed that shows how much the literature has sort of increased in the past few years. And you can find some of the experiences of centers, like for example, the experience of Jacqueline Dornay, which is published in the SGRT book. So many centers have taken the leap to go mark free. I like to call it skin mark free <laughs> so that we keep it in mind what we're talking about here. And they've taken different approaches. And I thought I will bring you the example of my experience at Alfred Health, where we have taken, we were one of the first implementer of this technology. And so we sort of were early adopters and we took a very cautious approach. So we compared, for example, um, three groups of patients in which we had skin marks alone, Skin marks plus SGRT and SGRT alone. And we did this by using IGRT data as a baseline and starting with the breast cancer patients because of the implications that I talked to you about before. So this analysis and this experience was for us very important. We published that, uh, we presented, sorry, that at ESTRO and it was also published in the conference sort of highlights. And what we have found is that SGRT setup and this is a very small image here, but you can see cohort two and three are the cohorts with SGRT with skin marks and then SGRT alone were uh, more accurate and statistically significantly than the skin marks alone, which is cohort one. In some cases, we also found that the standard deviations were also reduced, which meant that we had greater setup consistency and reliability. This was an important experience for us, which allowed us to then perform an assessment and action to remove the marks on other body sites, such as, for example, the pelvis and abdomen and chest. And a center like the Alfred is now treating and positioning all these sort of areas of the body, like torso areas without any skin marks of any kind, permanent or temporary. So there are other centers that had a sort of a different approach. For example, my colleagues at Peter McCallum Cancer Center, I think uh, they were amazing in the way that they decided to implement SGRT alongside sort of removing the, the marks. And they did this in order to reduce the tug between the existing clinical workflow and the changes to this workflow caused by SGRT. So they did one change and they did train their staff very well. And then they followed up their clinical data and they performed an analysis of the patients that were treated between August 2021 and November 2021 to see the accuracy of the positioning. And it was very interesting to see that even by going directly to skin mark free, they found that tattoo and mark free with aligner T improved the mean vector displacement compared with conventional three point localization for breast cancer patients. So I think it is important to remember that there is prior experience from centers and that maybe we can actually move towards this type of approaches for setting up our patients. So it is important though to remember that our line RT or any SGRT system are not only a setup tool, but they're also a monitoring tool. And monitoring is very important. Generally, monitoring is done once the patient is set up and the imaging or the free treatment verification imaging is performed. I am very cautious to say that, you know, we still need some imaging for the majority of the treatment sites and that replacing with SGRT, IGRT needs to be done with a lot of uh, sort of caution and, and a lot of analysis. 
So usually what we do is that we apply the imaging shift and then we reacquire a reference capture. And I think the previous speaker is talking about that. And then we use that to monitor the patient. So monitoring the patient can be of high importance for all treatment, but also in particular for treatment like Sabre, in which we are delivering very high dose per fraction. So the patient spends quite a lot of time on the treatment couch. What I want to say is that SGRT is not replacing anything here, but it's complementing the existing IGRT workflow because it can address some limitations. Like, like for example, the fact that IGRT most of the time has a static nature. I mean, this is different if you have like real tumor tracking, but most of us don't have that technology. And so having something that can monitor the patient completely on the, uh, like all the time on the couch, it's really important. It can also sort of address the inability of IGRT to account for postural changing. We're usually doing the imaging of the area that we're treating, the tumor area. So we are not seeing what happens around it. And this can be done with, IGR, uh, with SGRT. And obviously SGRT has the advantage of being non-ionizing so we can keep on that sort of beam all the time. SGRT system, as we've heard before, have also been designed to be used for um, gating the beam in some positions. And um, in most applications, they have been using in order to perform brittle type of treatments. The most used application of this system is for the IBH, so deep inspiration breath hold, uh, mainly for treatment site like, for example, chest or, or breast. However, some of us have also implemented this technology for EBH, so for expiration breath hold. The way it works is that we acquire a free bleeding scan that we then use in order to position the patient so that we don't have to have the patient in breath hold. So we have this free bleeding surface. And then we also acquire the breath hold scan that we use for setup imaging and treatment delivery. And this is just an example of the um, Aligner T system. So real-time coaching that we can give to the patient. This is just a monitor that can be mounted on the couch and that the patient can see in order to see if they are in the correct position. And then obviously, I also want to mention head and neck and brain as a site that has and is benefiting a lot from the introduction of SGRT. So with SGRT, we are now getting closer to removing the mask and, and maybe not fully completed just yet. But as you know, there are a lot of publications that talk about the experience of patients with the radiotherapy mask. For some of these patients, this is the worst memory of their treatment. And some patients refuse treatment because of the mask. So the ability to at least open part of it is enormous. And here you can see that what we do is that we actually monitor the area that is open in the mask, which usually include the nose and sort of the, 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 the middle part of the face with the eyes. And this is an example from our institution, from Peter Mack. So this is the setup that we have for stereotactic treatments of brain, in which we use a CDR stabilization with Freedom X board. And we use a personalized head and neck foam support using the intuition click with the CDR open face to a layer mask. You can see here how nicely open is this mask in comparison to, to the more traditional closed mask. I am a strong believer of this sort of technology for this application, and this is how it's generally used. We tend to use that postural alignment sort of in order to position the patient before we put the mask. And then we sort of, um, as you can see here, define the ROI and then monitor, um, obviously perform our uh, Combium CT imaging or X-ray imaging. And then we perform a reference capture for which we use to monitor the patient throughout the treatment. One of the advantages of this technology is that if you don't have any imaging like exact track, where you can image in an oncoplanar sort of approach, you can actually uh, monitor the patient also with couch kits. And finally, this uh, type of technology can also be used in order to implement open face masks for head and neck patients. As you can see here, the mask can be open not only on the face, but also on the chest, and it allows you to position the patient and then monitor during the treatment. 
This has very big implication for applications such as pediatric patient treatments, in which obviously we can allow the patient to have an open face mask instead of the scary closed mask. Finally, um, the previous speaker has already mentioned also body extremities. This type of technology is groundbreaking for that. It is very difficult to reproduce the positioning for an extremity. We need you know, some sort of uh, back bag set up. Sometimes we also need the thermoplastic sort of a mask that we need to put on the top of this um, extremity. But SGRT is a total game changer. And this is a nice slide from one of my colleagues from Peter McCallum Cancer Center in which you can see how using the postural alignment and then monitoring with aligner T is, uh, provides an enormous benefit because it allows, first of all, to um, sort of modify and set up pitch roll and rotation before IGRT, reducing the number of images that we have to do in some cases, but also monitor the patient during the treatment. So finally, I'm a physicist, so I like to talk about physics quality assurance and give you an idea of the burden of having to QA these systems. In my experience, um, these systems are very easy to QA, very easy to commission, very easy to maintain. Um, when we started and we were sort of early adopters, we didn't have any specific guidelines for these technologies. But we tended to use the AAPM report TG147, which is really useful and still is for these type of application. We also use some of the tests, for example, for uh, commissioning the DIBH with the T task group 142. And these two reports already provide lists of tests and commissioning sort of um, tips that you should be following. However, we're very lucky because as of 2022, we have also guidelines specific for surface guided radiation therapy. One is the task group 302, which you've heard before, and the other one is the estro ACROP guideline, in which sort of some of the tests of the double APM report 147 are included, but there are also other sort of recommendations like the type of phantoms that you should be using for these type of tests. They need to be phantoms that are visible, um, that can be easily recognized from the SGRT system. So like, for example, this phantom, which is transparent, cannot be recognized by the system. So you need some sort of external um, shell or something that can actually be picked up by the system in order to perform your, your QA. This is an example of one of the tables that is provided in the TG302 report, which is a really nice report, and we're very happy that it came out. Finally, it is important to remember that these systems are used in a multidisciplinary environment, and we never need to forget that. So a lot of the use that these systems um, sort of have is um, in the treatment room. So they're used very extensively by the radiation therapist, at least in Australia. So it is important to design tests together and look at testing each step of the workflow with SGRT. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I just put it out there. Maybe one day SGRT is going to install in each Linux that we buy and is going to be standard of care. So thank you very much. And you have my email for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Panettieri. And if you'd wait till the end, also we'll have we do have several questions. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do you want me to start? Okay. Next is our last but not least speaker of the day is Dr. Sion Kim of uh, from BCU, Virginia, USA. Good morning, Dr. Kim. Let me share my screen. Can you see my presentation slide? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And because uh, we are a little late, so I'm going to just move on quickly. So today I'd like to uh, share um, and introduce a kind of new breathing motion management technique and then share our experience with this technique. I have no disclosure regarding this project and this talk. 
Uh, let me start with our uh, abdominal compression. The compression is one of the most commonly used breathing motion management methods and is known for its effectiveness while keeping full duty cycle. So it is very effective method in terms of uh, efficiency. It began almost three decades ago. So it started with so-called body frame and heart compression. So in Sweden, they actually tested this method with uh, 16 long run liver patients. And then they reported they were able to limit diaphragm motion within five to 10 milliliters. And then they also reported that they could get reproducibility for 90% of the patients set up within five to eight milliliters. However, uh, there are some concerns about this technique. First, uh, it is kind of funky, uh, so it can make uh, it can have, cause some collisions with the uh, uh, when you rotate the machine, and then uh, patients' discomfort is one of the issues, especially when uh, patients cough because it's hard compression. Plus. Um, because the box itself is sometimes too small. So a lot of like all these patients, they uh, were not able to fit in very well. So it was not comfortable. Plus because of this box, uh, there's a chance that it may cause an interference with your beams, especially when you have like a charged particle uh, beams, it can be a huge issue. So when I was in uh, University of Florida, Gainesville, uh, I was in charge of setting up SBRT program for long. And then when I, so I started with this uh, box system and a heart compression, uh, but one day one of the patients actually coughed and then he expressed kind of like he got that hurt with this compression. So I thought oh, it might be better to have soft compression. So what we did was we kind of like try to make a soft compression uh, by taking the balloon out of the blood pressure cuff and then uh, wrap that uh, balloon uh, around the patient's body using Velcro wrap. Then we measured um, the pressure. So we actually invented soft compression method first and we uh, presented in ASTRO 2006. These days, as you all know very well, there are a lot of uh, commercial soft compression devices available and they are popularly used these days. And even for proton therapy, so this is actually uh, an example, uh, University of Pennsylvania, they actually reported their experience uh, with the, big, uh, the compression bed for their proton patients. However, the reproducibility of abdominal compression can be inconstant, and we often observe distortions. This is an example that we actually uh, observe in this image. So, though this image, okay, this is the reference image. And that is pointing uh, CT images. As you can see, in especially in uh, front side of the abdomen, we often observe significant distortion because it is so difficult to reproduce the exact setup every day. So we were wondering how to improve this problem. And then in 2020, as all we know. COVID came. So with under the COVID era, then we was considering uh, to minimize patient's contact and set up time as well. So we tried to go out of the box and then to establish a method. First, that is simple, but as effective as compression belt while keeping full duty cycle. And second, it functions with no physical contact with the patients. 
and at the same time, it works with the minimal set of time. So uh, then to achieve that goal, we started to have putting a question, is it possible to remove external force, which is the root cause of distortion, patient's contact, and extended set of time. Then we came up with the idea, the concept of fast uh, shallow bleeding. Fast shallow bleeding can be explained with this diagram very well. So this one shows uh, basically normal bleeding pattern. When we have shallow bleeding, the magnitude will be smaller than normal bleeding. However, the problem with this, this shallow bleeding is that now, because you have much less amount of air you inhale, it is questionable whether the patients can maintain, keep this pattern for a long time enough for, for, for treatment. So next idea is, oh, how about to make them to breathe fast so that they can actually have same amount of air for the same time. So this is the concept of fast shallow breathing. Now the question is how to easily realize this fast shallow breathing concept without external force. So we came up with this idea, contactless compression, and that could be result and might be possible to do that if you use metronome. So we started uh, to use this concept for our patient's uh, motion management. So this isn't the first case. So we did uh, we try this one first with the long patients. Uh, it was a male at 55 years old. And then we actually, in the beginning, we did three different scans, three bleeding scans, then compression band that we used to use, so the compression band. It was a commercial compression band. And then we did this fellow shell, uh, fast shallow bleeding with a metronome uh, scan. Uh, in this first uh, patient case, we, you, we ended up using 50 BPM. So 50 BPM means 50 bit per minute. The bit per minute means every breathing cycle, we have two bits. So basically, 50 BPM indicates 25 breathing cycles per minute. And this shows the result uh, of the free breathing case. So free breathing case, uh, what we did is we, uh, we did 40 CP with the free breathing. So it shows EOI and EOE, so end of inhalation images and end of exhalation image. Between those two images, we observe almost like a 4.5 cm motion. And this one shows a case with compression. So between EUI and EUE, we observe about 1.7 cm motion. And this is the result with our 50 BPM uh, fast shallow breathing. It actually showed about 1.6 cm motion. So in summary, in, uh, in a table, we observe circulatory motion uh, 4.5 to about 5 cm on the breathing and 1.7 cm on the compression valve and one point, about 1.6 cm on the fast shallow breathing with 50 bpm. So it turned out the method that we actually tried was effective and the patients was able to follow. So what we actually, uh, when we started this uh, method, we bought a metronome in, from Amazon and that was only $10. So it was actually, we were able to solve this issue, issue with only $10. It was very uh, cheap. And actually this one is, shows uh, another case uh, comparing normal uh, free breathing 40 CP versus 
uh, first shallow bleeding uh, for the CT on the 60 BPI. Let me share that. As you can see, this patient saw much smaller motion with fast shallow bleeding compared to the normal bleeding. So we re use this method for uh, many, many patients. Then we retrospectively analyzed uh, how effective the method was. So we compared uh, between free bleeding uh, for the CT and then skin. So we named this technique as shallow kinetics in this bimetro. Um, then this graph shows the result, the comparison result between uh, among uh, 12 targets in 10 patients. So in average, uh, the, uh, it reduced from 14.6 plus minus 8.5 millimeter motion to 9.3 plus minus 3.7 millimeter. So then we actually uh, assessed uh, volume change between uh, polyvalent and skin. So which we reviewed IGTV reduction, and then uh, average we were able to obtain about 20% of uh, the volume reduction with skin compared to free bleeding. One interesting thing that we observed was that here, in this case, this was actually second uh, target, uh, even though the, we uh, observed that the motion itself was smaller in skin. However, the volume actually turned out slightly larger than free So then we uh, looked into uh, uh, carefully and found that, so basically uh, this uh, skin, so this metronome guided uh, 40, actually made the patients to breathe much more consistent compared to free breathing 40. It showed that there are a lot of artifacts because the pattern, breathing pattern was not that consistent for that patient. So what it means, basically, when you draw your target volume using 40 CT on the free breathing, you have higher chance of making uh, like an unaccurate uh, controlling because of a lot of artifacts. Compared to that, if you draw the volume using this uh, fast shallow bleeding or like a guided uh, the body CT using metronome, you have much more regular, uh, regularized pattern and then you can actually draw more accurate volume. So this difference is totally based on that uncertainty rather than motion. Uh, and then we actually, uh, that the previous, uh, the competition was with the patients who had both free breathing data and uh, skin data, so fast shallow breathing data. But some more patients didn't really have all those things because we reduced the time to reduce the time, we just directly went to skin. So anyway, so this data shows the average motion for 18 targets in 14 patients who we actually treated uh, during uh, uh, COVID era. So the whole overall effectiveness was 8.2 plus minus 4.1 millimeter. So in actual treatment, uh, we uh, monitor how patients comply this uh, fast shallow bleeding using uh, soft uh, imaging system. Uh, but uh, this uh, slide actually shows actual internal uh, target using cognitive CT. So the first one on top, that was a case uh, who showed moderate motion. And the second one was the case with the kind of large motion. And the last one is the patient's uh, conducive data uh, who had a very small motion. 
as you can see, uh, you can see the target very well. And then all of targets are within uh, ITD, the inner circle, inner control is actually uh, ITD. The outer one is actually PT. As uh, mentioned by previous uh, speakers, it is one of the most important part in motion management is actually education and training. In this method, when we use this scheme, uh, because it is so simple, and in addition to that, you can easily find metronome uh, beep using smartphone or like that, such as a uh, cheap uh, digital metronome. You can easily practice it uh, by himself, himself or herself at home. So they can actually do optimization. So by doing this exercise, the patients can find the best uh, number, like a best speed for them. So they can actually optimize the BPM. But they, when they come with that number, we can actually start from that number. And then we can find uh, best uh, optimum uh, speed for each patient. Actually, this is just like a, I'm, I'm just gonna show this uh, uh, website. So in YouTube, if you go this uh, URL, you can see, uh, you can actually obtain this uh, metronome, guitar metronome in YouTube. So in summary, skin is effective. It is probably the simplest method and then probably the easiest method and probably the cheapest method so far. Uh, and then it is very simple, easy to do self training and self personalized automation is uh, possible as well. So, uh, simply, it is a clean infection resistant process because there is no contact and, uh, and because it is so simple and cheap. I think this can be easily implemented in almost everywhere, including low and middle income countries where you don't have much resources. Lung patients uh, or some abdominal cancer patients, they uh, have some problem in the, uh, the breathing. So it could be very vulnerable. So that seems like a like this. In ideal world, we want to have something like this, but uh, it is very extremely difficult. More optimum solution could be something like this. So this skin could be a uh, very optimum and practical solution for many things. And more information can be found in this uh, article recently published, and then uh, there are multiple people involved in this project. Uh, okay. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I uh, strongly encourage a lot of uh, people and uh, in the audience, uh, you may want to try this one. This is great uh, uh, method, which is very cost effective, simple, and patients oriented, that is patient, patient specific approach. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, well, there were several questions. I believe many of them were for Dr. Comer, but I guess we, I will start with the question that disappeared now. Uh, but it was by Dr. Pittman, uh, Yakov Pittman, and it had to do with skin tones, and it was for Vanessa. Um, I think it was about the limitation of skin. Sorry, I think I I, um, I couldn't hear the last part of the question, but I think it's about skin tone. It's, it's a very valid question. So some of these systems allow to select the skin tone of the patients, um, of at least some of the versions, previous versions of, uh, for example, an NRT used to ask you to select the skin tone, and now it doesn't anymore. I mean, there are, obviously there are publications that talk about commissioning 
um, skin tone and, and sort of see what is the effect of changing that skin tone. So if you look in the literature, even some of the more recent publication, one is with the use of SGRT in, in BOR, and it does talk about skin tone. However, my advice would be to actually test it. Um, our uh, colleagues at Peter Mack have done very extensive testing where they've used different sort of um, uh, skin tone. I don't know, like um, they look like little cards, which they've put on a phantom and they've looked at the effect. So I think that should be done in combination also with your room lighting, because that's another sort of factor that you should be taking into account. And again, with these systems, room lighting is very important. So if you commission, if you like calibrate the system with the room lighting, you shouldn't have a very different light when you're treating your patient. So you should keep it within certain levels. And at least this is my experience with the Vision RT system. So, so yes, it is an important consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Ali Tahiri, and it's uh, for you, Siong. The FSB technique seems very patient dependent. How do you plan to address this problem? Uh, it is a very uh, good question. Uh, as we may know, okay, there's no single solution for motion management that works for everybody. We all know that. Some patients can do very well. Uh, they can comply. Some patients cannot. For, for example, we, I just um, simulated one of the patients who were basically uh, had a dementia. So no way to actually ask something complicated in the instruction. So we have to find the best option for each patient if that is possible. Uh, but anyway, so back to this FSB technique. Uh, based on our experience, uh, about 60 or 70 percent of the patients were able to actually do that. So we uh, then, then of course, each patient will have different number of BPM. So some patients can actually do up to 60 BPM. Some may not be able to do that. So pretty much like what we found was that if we have about more than 45 and ideally uh, high, uh, faster than 50 BPM, it is very effective. And then as I mentioned, this thing can be optimized easily because it's so easy for patients to actually practice at home, even come they have a simulation. So if they cannot do it, then we are not able to do that. So anyway, it is actually a very good question. Thank you. I think I saw someone uh, with their hands um, raised. Uh, Anna, Anna Maria Nicola, or Nicolo. Okay, maybe that was a mistake. Um, okay, for Vanessa, you said that SGRT um, uh, eliminates the need for tattoos, right? And uh, you said some centers took the leap uh, to go marker, uh, mark free. Do you think it could also eliminate the need for lasers altogether? And um, some centers take a leap to go laser free, set of lasers? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, uh, you know, it depends what you're using your laser for. <laughs> Like if you're doing all your quality assurance by using imaging, maybe in the future we will be without lasers. Um, it's, it's a thought. I mean, as a physicist working in the field for many years, I, I, you know, I'm a little bit scared by the idea of not having lasers in the room. But especially now that we have a lot of machines that have sort of in bore type of design, maybe, maybe we will get you know, less and less using the lasers. So I don't know. I, I mean, it's something to think about. And also it doesn't really affect the patient. <laughs> Vanessa, actually I have a question. Yes. Uh, when you use uh, the body outline features for patient setup. Yeah. I'm just wondering, whether you actually scan the patients that's such a long uh, length 
or um, how do you prepare that body outlines as a reference uh, images? Because yeah, you, you, you need to have, have it in the scan. You scan the whole length. Well, you need yeah, you need to have it in the in the CT scan. Yes, but isn't in it... order to have the outline. Mm. Okay. But you you only need the outline of the area that you want to position. So you're not going to use the outline of the entire body unless you, you know, you want so, which becomes more complex. But yes, it only, it only defines that sort mm -hmm. of contour according to what you've scanned. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I had a quick follow-up question for you, for um, both panelists here. And that, I know that you mentioned the, qu the question about skin color, but what about... Um, like hair on the patient and the extent of hair that's on there and how much that might obfuscate um, uh, the the surface. Uh, you know, some some cultures don't want to. You know, they they're prevented from you know shaving or or cutting their hair, and so that makes it a little bit more challenging for them. Uh, what option do? How does it would perform in those scenarios? Again, a very good question. I wish uh, there was one of the therapists that spends the majority of the time, you know, positioning the patient that could answer that question. But um, I do know that, you know, sort of body hair are okay for these systems. Um, obviously, hair more in the area of the face, well, then we'll have to make sure that the ROI doesn't include, you know, beard or anything like that, which is usually doesn't because they're under the mask anyway. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a very good question. But no, in terms of body hair, we have seen like we can see it in the video function, but it doesn't affect as much the accuracy of the positioning. At least with SGRT. So you so you can or you uh, you're not really able to like the lasers can't surely surely penetrate through you know very thick hair and uh, unable to capture the surface of the patient whereas you might have that information from the the CT scan if someone were to to go through and render it uh, on a on like create a body contour for example. Well, these days, actually, all cameras have relatively large field of view. So you can choose region of interest uh, by avoiding the area you have too much hairs. In general, I think that's probably uh, the, the people are doing right now. And in addition to that, in the future, uh, I don't know whether, I mean, uh, um, if you have, right now the brain, the, the brain lab, they provide um, some of, imaging uh, device. So if you have a thermal imaging image, uh, you, you may be able to avoid that kind of problem. But it, to me, it's actually basically the same question, similar question. Uh, when we uh, do surface dynamic guided, uh, like a setup or monitoring, one concern I have is basically, I mean, head and neck is pretty okay. And even breast may be okay. Don't have much problems, but uh, especially when we treat like a lower, uh, like a then abdomen, like a pelvic area. I don't know if it is easy to actually have patients naked for the whole uh, treatment. That may not be easy, especially in US. Uh, Europe may be okay <laughs> because of the, they have some, such a, uh, like an open culture, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's it is very difficult to do that in uh, ESA. Yes, it's definitely a consideration um, that um, I've recently visited the US and we were talking about this with some of the colleagues there. Um, in Australia, we do tend to treat our patients without clothing in the area that we treat. So that makes it easier to track. Um, the same with bolus. I mean, um, you know, you have to sort of, take into account that the bolus needs to be visible by the cameras when you're using it. So that's another consideration. So anything on the top of the body, yes. So yes, I, I, it will be interesting to see what happens with the thermal camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, um, I think you answered that answers uh, the other question that Ali has. And uh, if people have no more questions, I would like uh, to conclude. Um, it's coming close to an hour and a half since we started, and we appreciate your time. Um, if the audience have more further questions, please feel free to email it to us. I also encourage people to join Medical Physics for World Benefit. Um, that's on www.mpwb.org. Um, membership is discounted for international uh, members or folks, especially from um, lower middle income countries. So please do check our website. I would like to, uh, to thank Dr. Vanessa uh, Panettieri, Dr. Um, Sarabha Kumar, I think has left, and Dr. Sion Kim for the great presentations today. Um, also, we would like to thank Vision RT and Randy Miller. Thank you to the WAPM headquarters, to our MPWB board members, and obviously uh, to our participants. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, the video is recorded and it will be uploaded uh, to our uh, YouTube channel. So please, uh, if you would like to share it or watch it again, please feel free to do so. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.